Well, thank you everyone, first and foremost, uh, for joining at this event. Uh, I'll share my slides uh, shortly, uh, which is uh, the our introduction to blockchain, our first event in our Tezos education series. Uh, and let's get some screen sharing. Well, welcome everyone uh, to this event in the Tezos education series by Encode. It is the start of a three part series in which we will educate you, have you build projects, and some of you uh, found startups that go on achieve fantastic success. Uh, I'm Anthony, I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Encode Club. We'll tell you a little bit about Encode Club uh, to begin with, but we're so happy to have you with us today. Um, first off, a little bit of a request really, uh, which hopefully is in your benefit. Uh, so we want you to shout from the rooftops that you're at this event. And you should know that you are, um, just by being here, you're, you're, it's free alpha really. It's You are putting yourself in such a good position. A, you're educating yourself, but B, uh, blockchain, despite what everyone says uh, or might say or might not say, is still incredibly nascent. And the opportunities are incredibly huge for the person that really dedicates themselves to blockchain, to Tezos, and to the opportunities that come uh, throughout all of that that I've just mentioned. Um, so you're early. And the most important thing about being early is focusing on learning more and also building a network of friends and people you work with and are gonna do great things with the blockchain. In the spirit of creating friends, uh, we have a lovely Twitter. So go and post uh, that you are at this event, uh, tag the Encode Club Twitter. Um, Steve and Ness will make sure the, the right Twitter is there. Tag, tag Tezos and say that you're part of this event. Send an awkward screenshot of me doing a funny face as you've caught me uh, in the wrong pose, uh, but uh, say you're part of this event that you're ready to hear to learn about Tezos, we'll give you a retweet. That'll be your reward. If you re if you invest in your network and go out and say, I'm at this event, I'm here, I'm ready, we'll give you a retweet from the main account. Uh, so, so go and do that uh, And uh, while I'm talking, but also pay attention to what I'm saying, um, to tag Encode and Tezos, and uh, at least on the code side, we'll give you a lovely retweet. Um, this uh, series uh, is a three-part series, as I've mentioned, and um, it's going to last over many months. Um, it's all going to be recorded along the way. Some of it will require more participation than others. Today starts an eight-event education series happening every week at this time, uh, where we will talk to you about a different, uh, or us and fantastic partners, will talk to you about uh, specific parts of the Tezos uh, ecosystem and journey and experience of learning. Uh, we'll then move into a hackathon. For those who aren't familiar with the hackathon concept, it's where you build projects, maybe for the first time. You'll build projects on Tezos. You'll have a wide range of things you can build and you'll be rewarded by prizes. And this is the best place to start building up uh, a, some, a body of experience to try the technology. Uh, and also if any of you are uh, minded to be founders or work in the space full time, they are the best launch pad to do so. If you really do want to become a founder, and we hope some of you that your journey starting today um, not ends, but includes running a company maybe, uh, is a 10 week uh, accelerator that will happen for the best, or we'll take the best teams in the hackathon and put them into a separate structure to try and make sure to guarantee that you succeed, or at least to try as hard as possible to make sure you succeed as founders. Um, so that's what's in store throughout this series. You can find out more by going to the website at encode.club slash Tezos, where everything is here and you can see and sign up to everything. Hackathon isn't, um, isn't open for registrations yet, but will be very shortly and we will love to have you. And certainly if you're here today, your application very much will be fast tracked. Uh, what is Encode Club? Uh, Encode Club is what we'd like to say, or at least try to be a spice to be, is the best place for web through education, through education, boot camps, uh, AMAs, hackathons, accelerators, investing. What we're trying to do is organize fantastic programs with the best partners, one of which we have today, uh, that allow you to go on your journey to, to achieve the, your personal and professional goals in crypto and then go on and make an impact, be, the, be that getting a job, building a great product, building a startup, building your network, or even just upskilling yourself. This is very important to us and we really hope you seize this opportunity and, and kind of really learn with us and we'll give you as much as, as you put in and if not more uh, for doing so. Um, we also, as I said, a really good place for jobs and um, not everyone can found a company, but a lot of you here today might be looking to get full time to the space. So we have a dedicated uh, in-house uh, recruiter who will happily sit with you, um, help you get your CV and all that stuff ready and then help you get a job in the Tesla's ecosystem that make me so, so happy. And when we, there's tons of, we call them the Encode Mafia, uh, going around who've gone through Encode programs and are now involved in crypto full time and Web3. And we'd like you to be part of that next generation, particularly on the Tezos in the Tezos ecosystem. Um, this isn't our first radio with Tezos, by the way. Um, it's our second radio. Uh, the first radio was back in 20, this is uh, finished up in 2020, which feels like a long time ago. 
well, pretty much just for the pandemic. And uh, you can have a look here. Uh, Tesla was one of our kind of gold partners then. And there were some amazing projects here from guys that have gone on to incredible success. Uh, so if you do want to have a look uh, for a few years ago, uh, which is feels a long time ago now, uh, you can have a look there at one of our earliest hackathons we ever did. So I'm so pleased that we can now go all the way back and uh, we'll, re we'll start the journey again and, and educate the next generation on Tezos. Key thing, as you've already seen already here, everything we do is free, global, uh, absolutely virtual. Uh, and uh, this is to make, and I see so many different countries, I think I counted at least 20, 30 there. And um, this really is part of what we want to do at Encode. You're part of a club. Uh, we're not just a community and it's free and it's there for you and it's accessible anywhere in the world. Uh, really, I think uh, capturing the very heart of, of missions of permissionlessness. And if you're not sure where to talk, we'll start, come talk to us. So you see this blue background, um, which most of the Encode members have. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking at it from now. Uh, but most of you, most of you, if you see the blue background, if you see the Encode name, if you're on the Discord, come talk to us. We're very friendly. It's what, what I really pride myself on, or pride Encode on, is that we try and make the efficient things efficient, but we don't ever try and scale or we don't even try and compromise on is talking to you and getting to know you and helping you uh, with your education on, on your journey. Uh, so what you can do is scan this QR code. I'll leave it on the page for a moment and uh, it will take you to a form uh, to um, fill in if you want to kind of get some direct support. But to be fair, just being part of this program, you'll get it anyway. Uh, so uh, just ping us uh, on the Discord or anything, and this will kind of help you get started. Uh, but being part of this program is more than enough, and we will directly contact you as well. But today's event actually has two purposes. It's to introduce this series, but also introduce blockchain. Now, I'm going to try and do this in two ways. Um, I'm going to try, some of you might know what blockchain is, so I'm going to try and make it interesting for those who do know what a blockchain is and also for those of you that don't just try and take you through us on the journey uh, if you have any questions along the way please put it into chat um, but what we're going to start off by doing is a little kind of exercise uh, which is by show of hands there's a beautiful raise hand function uh, that i need to find now uh, it's in reactions you'll see i'm going to raise my hand where is it raise my hand do you see little hands up one uh, so I want to do a few raising hand exercises uh, just to kind of uh, kind of uh, see what the level is. So first of all, can you, I'm going to undo my raise hand. So first of all, can you raise your hand uh, if you know what blockchain is? So raise your hand if you know what blockchain is. Okay, lots of hands being raised. I know we'll get some who are <laughs> a bit shy, but loads of hands being raised. Okay, very cool. Uh, keep raising your hands if you know what blockchain is. It's good. Excellent. I love to hear this. Uh, right, take your hands down. Uh, if you can, so if you click reactions and then lo lower hand, so you can lower hand down, lower down, lower down, lower down. And the second thing, guys, is uh, how many of you know what Tezos is? Uh, no being like you have a decent idea or you're a holder of Tez. Okay. Hands up if you know what Tezos is. Okay. Fairly good. I like it. Uh, Any more? Good. Fairly good cross section. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent. Um, and then last but not least, um, how many of you, so lower your hands, don't take it down, uh, how many of you know how to code in some way, any language, it can be Python, it can be MATLAB, it can be JavaScript, it can be Solidity, it can be Mickelson, it can be um, Go, it can be whatever it would be, how many know how to code? Okay, lots and lots of people as well. Uh, so good cross-section already. So it's always good to know what audience is, uh, just so you can know how technical to be. And in general, I'll try and make this uh, accessible as all events that encode are, and we'll have some more technical events uh, to come. So hands down, everyone. Oh, you can keep them up if you so want to, but uh, uh, keep your hands in the air, but uh, actually you don't need to, so let's bring them down. Uh, so we talk about what is blockchain today and uh, use it to talk a little bit about Tezos. We've got a proper hour-long introduction to Tezos next week. So this one is kind of really setting the stage for this, but also giving a bit of a taste. Um, we're going to cover different areas. Uh, some of them I'm going to go into some, a lot of detail, some I'm not going to go into that much detail um, and uh, talk to you about what blockchain is for first principles, really. Um, but um, here we go. Let's go into what is blockchain. Uh, so um, blockchain is uh, a, well, hopefully, let's, hopefully all of you know to some level, uh, blockchain fundamentally is a ledger. Uh, it's a ledger that is, um, I'm going to go back a slide, a ledger that is um, almost like a database, a spreadsheet. It captures information. It allows, it's publicly accessible. But it's so much more than that. It's a ledger that's also a decentralized computer that we can all take part in. It's a ledger that can sustain potentially a cryptocurrency, as many of you know about. Um, the possibilities are not endless by any means, but the possibilities are far more than you'd think a, a database can do, because it's more than a database. 
Um, it's gonna, it uses some quite complicated um, uh, concepts in the grand scheme of things and quite complicated technology uh, in order to do it. Uh, so the hardest thing you're gonna to learn today is cryptocratic uh, hash functions. Um, I'm not gonna go into the technical complicated stuff because we actually are gonna go into consensus and all that later. Uh, but in general, uh, what we're trying to do with a cryptographic hash function, uh, with, which is with cryptography, is map uh, an input and return an output in basic, in the most general sense. Specifically, um, we're going to try and map messages, transactions, and keys uh, to an output, which is something called a hash, which is a, basically a very long kind of output of numbers and digits. You might be thinking, why the hell would we do that? Um, well, we do this because we are trying to um, make something that is hard to reverse engineer. That we put small changes to input results in something that's very hard to change once you have the output. Specifically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to basically keep a log of something that is going to be very, very hard uh, to reverse later. I don't really want to go too much into the cryptography side because I don't want to scare you in the first message. But the first thing you have to know is we are not just making a spreadsheet here. We're not just making some simple database. We are doing something that is permanent and really difficult to change. And we do that with hashing and with cryptography. And those who are kind of cryptographers or are interested in minding that, we will definitely put some references into chat that you can go into. Um, but what we actually care about with a blockchain or what the ways to actually think about it beyond this kind of hashing and cryptography uh, is the most simple way to think of it is money. Um, and let's think of it like this. So A owes B $5 uh, for a pizza. Uh, a owes B $7 for a donut. B owes A $4 for a pretzel. A owes B $2 for a chocolate bar. If you add all these together, so A is clearly a very greedy chap, um, B likes pretzels, um, you get the fact that A owes B $10. But what does this mean? Why do we have this concept called money? Like, why, what does money even exist for? Why do we need to have this in relation to blockchain? Why does this matter? Let's talk about that for a moment. Well, money originally existed um, as a means of exchange, because originally um, in the times gone by, times very far ago, um, the only way to kind of trade something would be to literally trade it. So if I have seven sheep and I want one of your cows, I trade two sheep for my cow, if that's the thing that's the, I trade two sheep for your cow, if that's the kind of group we come to. And that's great. And maybe I shall sell a few pigeons uh, for a pig. I don't know. All this. And it's great. Uh, but eventually you get it down to the problem of, well, Okay, what if uh, <laughs> what if it take what if I don't have enough farm animals or I can't physically move enough farm animals to trade something? And second, what if I want to do some a trade which I can't denominate in one sheep or one pig and one pigeon? Um, very quickly, you find that you need some medium exchange. This is what money is fundamentally. It's a medium exchange so we can value stuff and use it to trade with. So I don't actually have to physically give you like things that are real world objects that would be difficult to to move. This is where money exists for. And traditionally, money was this physical thing. And with physical money, you can keep track of it very easily. Like I, if it's just a gold coin, I can hold all my gold coins, except when I can't. Eventually, you might have too many gold coins that you can't actually hold them in one place. So I need to have some sort of representation of uh, something else. Um, I need to have some sort of uh, 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 way of saying, well, I have this money, but it's not with me right now to be a security risk. You get these things called banks emerge. Uh, and banks basically say, well, I believe, I'm saying this person has a million dollars. He doesn't need to hold a million dollars on him at any one point. And that's cool. But do you think banks hold all of this money in one vault? Isn't that a big risk? Like, isn't that problematic? Why do we need to have money backed by something physical? So we get this thing called digital money. Money is like something is this virtually on a balance sheet. It doesn't exist anywhere physically. Um, and this is great. But with a physical balance sheet, or with a uh, digital balance sheet, what is actually happening here? Well, a bank is basically saying, like in this list, that A has some amount of money and B has another. Um, and when someone makes a transaction, they're keeping along with this too. It's like a spreadsheet. It's like a, it's like a database entry and saying, okay, A owes B $5. So he's going to pay him $5 for this. A has $5 less. B has $5 more. Great. But this is maintained by banks. And banks are great for all, all well and good, but why couldn't we do this process, which looks like maintaining a database? Why couldn't we actually do it with code? Now, this is not the fundamental premise of blockchain. There's many other things that are fundamental. It's a really nice way of, of, of trying to of figure out why we have this thing at the blockchain in the first place. Why did this thing that Rishnish you might have heard of called Bitcoin emerge in the first place? Well, it emerged to basically say, 
well, why could we not like transfer value and money and have this all kind of maintained through code, through software? Why do I need a middleman that's a bank that's bloated and like we broadly don't trust and like has tens of thousands of employees. And also like anyone who uses a bank, it's like really hard to move between banks, like transfer money from Mexico to Hong Kong. It's a fairly slow process. <laughs> like why is it slow progress? Well, it's lots of banks talking to each other. Can't we start this again with, with code, with software? And so you get the idea of a distributed ledger. We need to go kind of more than that. Uh, so we have a central ledger notebook capable of recording transactions between two parties who trust each other and who basically settle things at the end of month or at a given point in time. What if we introduce more parties? Um, well, again, you, this gets starting to get more complicated, complicated here. You have to do with more transactions and you can start to see why kind of banks sort of emerge uh, in order to kind of uh, maintain all this kind of constant, like lots of different transactions and stuff. Um, but um, what if I don't trust the bank? What if I don't trust the middleman who's maintaining this? Like, can, can I do something kind of different? Um, well, I could, instead of having a bank record stuff, I could make sure that um, uh, we uh, have a central ledger that records transactions between multiple parties who don't trust each other, but instead uh, sign that this transaction is legit and that it's verified. Um, now, the question is, how do we verify these signatures are actually correct? Um, well, in blockchain, in crypto, uh, we have this idea of a digital signature. Uh, so this is basically something someone saying, oh, this is me, I am making this transaction, you know it's me, um, you don't have to KYC me, you don't have to have a bank identify me and check this is my account. Instead, digitally, I have a way of proving it's me. And we have two things in blockchain. We have uh, a secret key and a kind of private key and a public key. And a secret key, a private key is something only you know. Uh, any, of you, any of you that's opened up a, a ledger or something like that know that uh, <laughs> you don't want to expose ever the private key. You're kind of screwed if you do so. Uh, but the public key is this representation of your address that everyone kind of knows. Uh, and uh, if we're going to go very complicated, uh, <laughs> if we were trying to kind of map this, the input is the kind of message or secret key and the output of anything is a signature hash. Uh, and I'm not actually going to go too far into this because I noticed from the start of the audience, not a hugely technical audience. And I don't really want to bung, bung you down in, in kind of inputs and outputs and hashing and all that jazz. Um, but anyway, uh, the, 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 the TLDR of all of this is we want to have a cryptographic assure way to verify that a transaction has happened uh, and verify that it's happened um, with doing two things. One, without re revealing people's private keys and two, without relying on a central party to verify that this person is this person and Anapon is Anapon, that Anthony is Anthony and this transaction is secure. Um, and so we have this idea of a digital signature. And um, here, a central trustless ledger, which we'll kind of call a website, it's not really a website, records transactions between multiple parties who broadly settle at the end of the month. All these transactions must be digitally signed. signed. But what if the same transact, same signature is applied to identical an identical transaction. Uh, so uh, let's say you have four um, uh, unique transaction IDs. Um, uh, what we actually want to do is make sure that every transaction is different. Because if they're not different, it's going to be very hard to identify who's done what. So in the blockchain, we need a way of doing this. And we do this with transaction IDs. Uh, and um, relative to my private key, it will produce a transaction ID um, that's um, without going too complicated anything thing that is completely unique. Um, so we get to the stage where we have a central trustless ledger calling transactions settling at a given point, and they've been all authenticated by digital signatures, but how can we make sure this actually happens at the end of the day? Um, well, we want to avoid this thing called overspending. Now overspending is, or double spending is a kind of, um, quite uh, important concept. Uh, it's basically the, the principle that makes all money system, monetary systems work. And it is basically the fact that um, I cannot have the case, if I pay with, I say I start with $100 in my account, I cannot pay both Steve and Anna upon $100 for this and the system still work because then I would have minus 100. So I can't, if the system is not able to recognize that I had $100, that I spent $100 and that I, have, that I haven't spent it again, then the system doesn't work. So we basically need a way of constantly um, organizing, chronological organizing, and keeping in, in check. So what we're trying to avoid here is this thing called double spending. Uh, and so what we need to, if, if you can double spend, then your currency is worth nothing. Um, and so we need to verify all these transactions are legit. And we need to then compile them in some way that their legitness 
uh, is publicly accessible and I all know this is true. Uh, so basically produce a database, a ledger of transactions that, I, that we think are, um, uh, are actually real. Uh, and uh, there's some properties of overspending that you don't wanna have. There's always, you can have money to move and that you never have to cash out. Uh, you can fully transact within the system. Um, so how do we make this happen? Uh, we do it broadly with smart contracts. Uh, smart contracts take cause and execute effect. Uh, I, if I pay $50, then move $50 from A's, A to B's accounts. Um, it's fully in code. It operates automatically. Um, Tesla allows you to use Mickelson Smart by LIGO and Morley. Uh, and um, what the net effect of this is, is that our current, uh, our central trusted ledger records transactions to multiple party who automatically set at the end of the month. And all of these transactions were authenticated by additional signatures. And who maintains this ledger? Uh, well, everyone has a copy of the ledger. Uh, transactions are broadcast for everyone to record. Uh, a has paid $50. And rather than having a system where I go to the bank, the bank records the thing has happened, only the bank records it within the bank or within a state, within a given nation, we're gonna try and tell everyone that the transaction has happened. Uh, this is the most important thing. And everyone broadly has a copy of a ledger and transactions are broadcasted for everyone to see the changes that are made. We're basically shouting from the rooftops that A paid B $50. So let's look at what a blockchain actually looks like in this sense. Look, let's look at what's happening live. Doesn't Venmo do that? It comes out of the moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, Venmo is centralized. So Venmo, the reason why... Uh, so the, what we're trying to avoid here is that one central party has to verify transactions happen. What we actually want is for everyone to see a transaction has happened, not have to trust one person who could be a malicious actor. Okay, so this is a blockchain in action. It, this is first an overview. Uh, we can see that like uh, different blocks coming through. We'll talk about what actually a block is here. We see these simple bakers, we'll talk about that. We can see how many transactions are happening. So in the last day, 348,000 transactions have happened. So that's quite cool. Um, uh, let's look at some stuff happening live. Uh, you can see that this is the latest block. You can see transactions happening. You see block happens every 30 seconds. Um, you can see people calling stuff. Um, stuff is happening live and everything is, is public. Uh, everything is available for me to see. Everything is on chain. Uh, every, I can see what is happening block by block. I can see what's happened in the past. I can see everything that's ever happened. Look at this, sent this and sent that and sent this. This is just a particular block. Let's look at the last block. Look what's happened, called an entry point, uh, sent money, received money, sent money, paid fees. This is like a public thing I can look at and see everything that's happening. And that is so different to a kind of traditional bank account where um, in a traditional bank account, like I see I've moved money from A to B. I don't see where it's gone for that. Like I can't see what's in the bank. Um, can anyone, anyone think of any problems with everyone seeing every transaction just out of interest? <laughs> Feel free to put into chat. No privacy. Yeah, good. Any other problems? Uh, not the target. We'll come to uh, maintain the state net becoming a target. Okay. Tax issue. Okay. Interesting. Good. Commission fees. Okay. All pretty good answers. So, uh, and, and it's interesting. Opera Cash says, um, everyone can see how broke you are. No, we'll give you a loan. I'm going to do with some of these. They're actually quite funny. Um, so, um, you can't, you couldn't see how broke, can see how broke someone is, but just because they have one wallet doesn't mean they don't have another. So yes, you can see how an individual, the poor and individual account is. But you don't know, you can't link this and to answer, uh, answer on Prakash's uh, thing. You don't know the real identity, you know their digital identity. Like I know their public key. I know their public identifier. Um, what I don't know is um, who this person actually is. Sometimes people will have um, kind of domain names, um, but, um, Usually, I don't know who this person is. So can anyone work out how you would turn, tell, uh, okay, you can, strictly speaking, if you were, had perfect information, well, if you were a government, you could tell who someone is. Do you know how you would do it? Where, where do you get doxxed? Where do you get, where does your uh, identity get revealed? IP address? Not really, that's not in a block. And exchange, yeah, really good, KYC. So exchange, using most exchanges to go from fiat, which is normal currency to crypto, and from crypto back to normal currency. Uh, you need to kind of, um, you need to um, KYC yourself. Uh, you need to log in. You need to lose like a password, an email, like a name. And it's this point that if you know that where they come in on the exchange side, and let's say that you buy Tezos on an exchange and then you move it to uh, a wallet on chain, 
uh, then you will, yeah, realistically, um, governments will kind of be able to trace back who you are. But me and you looking at this blockchain, I have no idea who people are. I don't have, I don't have perfect information by any means, um, by any shape or form. Um, but what this is, it, it's, it's private in the sense that everyone is hidden by a private, uh, public key, um, a public address. But what it isn't hidden by is I could see if I know that Steve is weaponized pixels.tez, I can probably figure out like what he's doing, how much he's worth, uh, which is an interesting one. And there are blockchains that are designed to be kind of fully private, um, the likes of Veneer and Zcash. But um, uh, <laughs> I've heard once that uh, someone said to me that uh, if the government figure out you're using Monero or Zcash, like you are screwed, you're on straight onto a list. Um, like of like a, 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 tent, a person to watch because that one really is. And blockchains are actually terrible for crime. Can anyone work out why? <laughs> why is a blockchain terrible for criminal activity? Yeah. It's traceable. You can see. I can see the money movement. It's like an absolute disaster. So it's funny that people say like, oh, crypto is used for crime. Like it's really, ever, if it, it's not, I don't think, well, not in crime, but I suspect it's not, um, but it would, only would be used because it's convenient. And it's not through the banking system, but like it's like very obviously public and trans tra tra traceable. And if you were a government entity, and most government agencies do, um, you can recover quite a lot of. Um, if I look at this, for instance, Bulgaria seized a ton of Bitcoin, <laughs> and like, it just sits there. It's worth a lot of money. Countries do this all the time because like it's like it's easy to work out like where the money's sitting and where it's come from. So you can broadly follow the information flow. I mean, they had probably seized it from a mining rig. Uh, but anyway, um, just something to kind of bear in mind is quite interesting. Um, you, I think you'd far, be far better using cash than anything crypto related for anything uh, like crime or, 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 or the same. Um, cool. Uh, so we talked about Ledger. Uh, let's put it together where we are now. So blockchain is effectively a database. It's a database that stores transactions. We've used money as the example here. Uh, and we try and basically we need to maintain uh, the sense that I am me that and I'm signing transactions and I'm verifying that I make the transactions and that these transactions are then broadcasted to everyone. This broadcasting part is the hard part. Like it's kind of easy to say like, OK, this digital account is Anthony and that just kind of Steve and Anthony paid Steve. I can kind of see that. But like, how am I telling everyone and updating everyone? That seems like a really complicated process. Traditionally, you use something called proof of work. And proof of work, uh, without getting into any of the specifics, I will make these slides available, basically says this, uh, you do a challenge. Uh, and this challenge uh, is to return a hash that starts with 30 zeros. What effect you're doing is you're using your computing cloud um, to answer a challenge to get the reward of mining a transaction, uh, which is great. And you are therefore investing computing power to do this, this work, this work to be the one who gets to do the transaction. And if you're kind of broadly found out to be the person, you like you've done this erroneously or you've not done it right, or you're trying to cheat, then you really like, unless you've like cheated perfectly, which is pretty impossible to do, you really are risking losing that work done, that time investment you've put in. So it's proof of work. Your reputation that you're putting on the line is the amount of time you're investing uh, to, um, uh, the reputation of the loan is the amount of time you're investing to try and mine this transaction you're competing at other people um so if you do it wrong you've lost that that money it's just kind of a silly system we'll talk about in a moment when i put it that way and so when people talk about blockchains being inefficient uh, and very energy intensive we're broadly talking about proof of uh, proof of work which is that you have to do this kind of it like it's neat and elegant but it's like stupid like it's wasting energy to do a transaction and uh, it's wasting energy for the person that even gets the transaction, but it's wasting energy for everyone trying to compete to do the transaction uh, and kind of solve the solution first, which is linked to the um, users competing to find a nonce that meets the network's requirement. Um, and um, yeah, uh, you have to basically kind of force it. You have to do lots of combinations uh, and you can check they've got the right answer because you just plug the non nonce in and check if you want to go complicated about it. But I don't want to go too complicated for you guys today. The simple thing is you're doing a, like a complex computational problem to try and get to the front of the queue to mine a transaction. Uh, and this is stupid uh, in simple terms. It's elegant, but stupid. Um, and um, it works though. Like it is a really good way to incentivize lots of people to kind of compete against each other to do this thing. And it's like a reputation system, but like it's kind of a silly way to do it. Um, we're not gonna go through kind of um, this stuff 
but we are going to talk about um, uh, how block works. So um, it's centers ledger basis. Now, what we're saying here, a blockchain is recording lots of different transactions. Uh, and all these transactions are signed by digital signatures. And uh, we have to have uh, decentralized consensus as to the correct record. How do we how do we kind of make sure we have the correct record? One thing we need to make sure we have the right order of transactions. And we do this broadly by making sure that the first, the second block contains the first block's hash. Like we, we kind of have them kind of staggered kind of chronologically. Uh, and that if you change the hash of a block, are you trying to rechange the history? Um, then you're basically changing the entire kind of uh, the way this is the kind of uh, entire proof of work, the entire history. Um, so um, also what we're trying to do is maintain this correct, this kind of correct ledger in order. Uh, and um, this is cool. And again, it works broadly, but I feel like we can do much better than like having people put work down as their stake. So Tezos uses a thing, and now we can actually introduce Tezos for the first time. Um, Tezos um, uses the thing called proof of stake. And proof of stake basically says, rather than coming to consensus, rather than shouting to the rooftops, rather than getting to be the one who shouts to the rooftops by competing for this complex transaction, um, rather than doing it, um, uh, uh, rather than doing it through work, why don't we just have people stake money, like tokens? And if they're found to be like, um, like doing it wrong, <laughs> Or like if they like are doing it badly or maliciously, they lose their stake. So they actually only put money on the line. And if they kind of don't do it right, they're going to lose money. And we can see this. So Tesla calls this um, people stakers, bakers. Uh, and uh, you can kind of see who the best bakers are. And they're basically basically the ones that have the most stakes on. We can see here a list of public bakers, so public stakers. Uh, why is this being slow? Yeah, so we can see that this part, like who staked the most, this person, Postdoc, has staked 33 million uh, Tez, which is a lot of money, <laughs> a lot of money. Uh, and these are the big ones kind of doing it. Um, and I think this is a more efficient system because you're not kind of wasting work, uh, but you also kind of still have a representation system in order to make sure uh, that uh, you um, are um, uh, still have a reputation to make sure that people are being good actors uh, when mining transactions. Um, and proof of stake basically means that the uh, the participants that kind of are get to be the ones that shout it from the rooftops are chosen as a function of their stake. So basically, the more tokens you have, the higher chance you have of getting uh, being able to kind of um, uh, mine a transaction. Um, and you don't just need to be the one uh, kind of doing this physical act. Um, if no, if you don't have enough stake to participate. Um, or you do not want to set up the needed infrastructure, you can just delegate your stake to other people. So these people, um, so P2P validator doesn't have 13 million. Uh, it basically um, has lots of people delegating to it um, and uh, giving it money to, for it to run its node, for it to do baking uh, in order that, um, uh, in order that uh, yeah, it's a, a, a more efficient system. And you can see the minimum delegation here is, is just one test. Um, and yeah. Um, so you can do that. Uh, and broadly, like, again, why is this better? So in a proof of stake system, a participant voting system is linked directly to the number of coins they have. So that's, um, as I say, if you have 100 coins, you can't really pretend you're a 1,000 different people uh, or then trying to kind of uh, ministry attack a blockchain. You could pretend to be 100 different people with a coin, but what you would get over this by uh, making the kind of voting power proportional to the number of coins they have. Uh, so effectively, all of what the, this amounts to is um, the people who we trust are the people with the most money delegated to them, either because they've staked a lot of money on the line that's their own money, or they've had it delegated to them, either people are making a bet that they are a good actor. Um, and as a result of this, again, by just not doing all the kind of erroneous stuff or uh, the efficient, unnecessary stuff of proof of, of, proof of work, um, you it's more energy efficient. In a proof of work system, you're kind of competing for the right to solve these random puzzles. Um, and in that sense, the more computing power someone has, the more likely they are, like in, in which favors kind of people to accumulate computer power. And you see things of like mining rigs in places where uh, it's really cool or there's easy access to energy. So like Iceland, for instance, or China. Um, or China isn't necessarily cool, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, by contrast, a proof work system resolves, revolves around the idea that the more coins you have, the more likely you are to create a block. And um, it's a system that, that Tezos was very early to, and most people are now following. Uh, and I think at the history of Tezos, 
Actually, I, I point you to a, a really good resource that we had Arthur, who's the founder of Tezos, uh, come and talk at Encos, uh, I think about a year ago. Uh, and uh, I will paste that into chat now. And actually, one of the things he talks about uh, is this idea that um, Tezos kind of has been, at least on the, a lot of the technological trends, fairly early, if not the first. Um, and one example recently is governance, which I think Tezos was talking about far before anyone else. And most people now are making governance like the most important thing. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's, uh, I think, a very, um, uh, at least if you want to kind of understand, um, not understand, but I think it's a very in, important kind of thing to say that, that Tezos broadly on the, on the tech is usually one of the early ones to, to trends. Of course, it's a blockchain. It's a public. It's an, it's everything is open source in a blockchain. You can see the code. That's part of the, the principle of it. So ultimately, at the end of the day, like um, ultimately at the end of the day, um, people can copy your innovation. Uh, but it's good to be the first mover. Um, you then have this thing called Tez. So crypto. Most blockchains have a inherent currency. It's kind of uh, apparent from my earlier talking in, in Tezos, it's Tez, it's Tez, and you have these things called bakers, which are the stakers that are listing transactions. And the reward you get the whole point of a cryptocurrency, the whole point of cryptocurrency is not to be money per se, not to be a medium of exchange. Uh, it is that it is the reward for using the blockchain for mining transactions. It's almost like a self fulfilling prophecy. Um, you have this thing called Tez in order to reward people for doing the valuable thing that is like doing stuff on the network, which they didn't have to pay fees for in Tez, which then gives Tez value. And so the whole point of this is not to create a currency. The whole point of this is to create, not currency to be used as money to transact, pay salaries in, but to create a currency with the utility of using Tezos for smart contracts uh, and the things we'll talk about in future weeks, building applications on top of this, this money layer, but also this money layer that you can do lots of good things with. Um, and yeah, um, we're not going to go into how you break a cryptocurrency. Um, I will say this one thing, though. The way you break it, as you can imagine, is by having the majority of the computing power, having 51% of the computing power. With big networks, this is pretty much impossible. At small networks, it is. If you had most of the computing power, you could rewrite everything. But if you had most of the computing power and most of the money, everything stakes, not even computing power, sorry, stakes, if you had like the 51% of all the stakes, like you'd be far better off just being the biggest miner than you would like destroying the Tezos blockchain and taking out all the Tez that is now like pretty much going to be worthless any moment now. This is one of the fundamental premises of a blockchain. One of the reasons why it works is it's pretty much always in your interests, um, especially in the long term, to like play as part of the system to get the rewards if you are the biggest baddest dog. Either you've got the biggest state, you've got the best computing power, all of this jazz. In this case, it's the biggest stake. Um, so yeah, it's kind of hard and you don't very often see you're only really worried about a blockchain kind of having problems at scale if they're not decentralized. Um, decentralization here is not a quality, it's a, it's a, it's a, a necessary um, feature. It's a massive feature needed uh, to make blockchains work because if you don't have that, you risk 51% attacks by having two big actors and people have, can't have confidence there's not going to be a 51% attack and the people are going to change the block history or run off with all the money. Uh, so you, by definition, have to be decentralized as a blockchain. Um, and obviously there is decentralization is not binary, it's a spectrum. Uh, you can be quite decentralized, you can be less decentralized, you can be very centralized. I'm not going to um, suggest names here at all. Um, uh, different blockchains have reputations for different levels of, of centralization. Uh, and this is a, a kind of design decision. Uh, we'll skip some of this stuff because I'm conscious of the time as well. So what is the end result of this like ledger of transactions? is that it's immutable, it can't be changed. It's decentralized, um, which I said by design. It's immutable because like things are confined to blocks that are then signed and then hashed, like this is quite kind of hard to do. Um, so uh, it's uh, immutable, can't be changed by definition, history is history. It's, decent it's decentralized because we want people to not be big enough that they can change, rewrite stuff. Um, it's secure, we use this thing called cryptography, which I've vaguely touched on. It's distributed, we're, we're trying to not use inter intermediaries. And we have this also, this thing called consensus, which is that rather than having to rely on a middleman like a bank, that we can rely on code and rely on this kind of consensus algorithm to share what the new things are, uh, to share updates and to maintain this database. So I don't want to tempt too much fate ahead of next week. But what is unique about Tezos? Well, four bracing main things. We already talked about proof of stake and delegation, which I think is a nice one. But maybe you're thinking, well, there's other proof of stake blockchains. Well, a few things. 
one, these blockchains are hard, big pieces of code. Um, it's all public. Like I can go and I can look at Tezos on GitHub and see it's there. It's ready to play with. I can fork it if I so want to. Um, but you don't want to with Tezos because Tezos has this thing called self-amendment. So governance is hard. If you're building like code that runs tons of hundreds of millions of dollars, billions, and you can build applications on, like it's not going to be perfect on day one. So self-amendment allows Tezos to upgrade itself without having to fork into two chains. And historically, there's been a lot that forked, like the Ethereum Classics, the a Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin Cash, all these jazz. Uh, so self-amendment is allowed for pro uh, progression of the chain. I think long-term is a pretty important thing. We've also got on-chain governance. Um, you've got um, kind of these things called election cycles, which we'll talk about later weeks that provide kind of formal and systematic way to reach agreement on proposals. Uh, and you've got this also thing called formal verification, which is that Tesos does smart contracts in a particular way. I, I talked about the languages briefly earlier. Uh, and um, it uses this thing called formal verification, which is a way to prove um, properties about uh, programs like smart contracts. I'm not going too much into that, but you should have an awareness of these uh, that um, when understanding Tezos. And the some effect of this uh, with a blockchain, and we'll talk about this later week, is that we might have this concept of Web3. And all of this is fun, all this is very esoteric, like how does the blockchain work, you move money. What is this all amounting to? What well, amounts to this concept you're going to hear a lot of Web3, which is basically a totally new way to engage with the internet, a totally new age of money, new financial primitives, um, protocols, things like Tezos that are built, that allow you to build stuff, that have their own intrinsic currencies, um, a different way of doing identity, like identity linked to your kind of public and you know, public key that I own and I custodize myself. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, also maybe this idea of, of at least our individual autonomy, because uh, we let the user kind of um, engage with the blockchain. It's in the user. There's no trust layer. There's no one you can fall back on if things go wrong. Uh, so all of this is maybe, and we'll talk about Web3 later, maybe a bit of a, a kind of new age. Um, maybe not. Uh, decide for yourself what you think Web3 means. Um, you've also got these things called other concepts we'll look at in the next few weeks. Uh, decentralized finance, NFTs, which you'll have heard of, uh, DAOs, and all of these are basically rethinking how we kind of do stuff with this basic principles we have with blockchain. So I'm going to call it uh, a day there and, and now take questions. Uh, please, if you, we have many events to come in this series. Uh, I think the next one, which is our intro to Tezos, which will go into far deeper form of what Tezos is. Uh, please do start for that. The Eventbrite will put down if the chat will also be invited by calendar uh, and via Eventbrite as well. Uh, so I'm going to take the chance now to answer some questions that have come through in chat. I'm sorry. Uh, how about one quantum computer reaching 51% of baking in the Tesla's network? Um, Jen, I must admit, I don't know the answer. Uh, perhaps all the Tesla's crowd do. Uh, the slides we put on chat, um, Ash, uh, Ashoko, Ashoko, I think, Ashoko. Um, uh, most blockchains are trying to be quantum resistant right now. Uh, generally, you're basically saying, what if we had the most powerful computer in the world? Couldn't we break all of this? And, I guess that theoretically, yes. I actually don't know if Tesla is quantum resistant, that you can ask them directly. Um, but like we're very, you know, anyone who knows anything about quantum computers knows we are very, very far off for even like in building basic functionality with quantum, let alone like a computer that can actually do something specific for the sake of like breaking a network. And also like, I don't think you'd want to break it. I think you'd like the whole point of it is like, why are you breaking this? Are you breaking it just to destroy the value? Or you're breaking it because you want to be the biggest person. Uh, no, this is not my company's technology. I, I am in Code Club. Uh, we are a Web3 education community. Uh, Tezos is an open uh, source uh, project company or a big protocol uh, that has been going for a number of years. That's founded by Arthur Brightman. And they are the technology we're going to be teaching about. And it is an example of a blockchain, if that wasn't uh, kind of clear. Uh, why 51%? What if Malicious Node has anything above? Yes, you could have anything above 50. I'm just 51% is just an arbitrary kind of number, just to say above 50. But yes, you could have 50.000000001. Uh, what's the difference between smart chain, Binance Smart Chain, cross chain? Uh, smart chain, I don't know what that means. Binance Smart Chain, Binance Smart Chain is a fork of Ethereum uh, that is run by Binance. Um, cross chain means going between different blockchains like Tezos to Ethereum to Binance Smart Chain to Polkadot to Avalanche. Uh, what do you think about the centralized aspect that eventually delegators converge? Yeah, that's a really interesting one. Um, do, do, do you end up getting these kind of big actors that are like the biggest bakers um, that are like big companies that are centralized themselves? So I think the answer is if the pro, the why, 
The answer is, what is the desire of decentralization? The desire here is not decentralization for the sake of itself, for a fun philosophical reason. It is necessary to maintain the network. And because we know that it's very hard to have 51% attack, um, I'm okay with like some bakers being quite centralized. And you can make the decision to use centralized bakers. There's nothing wrong with having centralized companies in a or so companies or centralized entities within a blockchain ecosystem, so long as the system of consensus and the system of being a user is itself decentralized and anyone can be a user. After that, it doesn't matter if you've got centralized entities within. That's absolutely fine. How expensive a transaction in proof of stake? Quite cheap. Um, I think it's a few cents these days. Um, we'd have to check on gas now, uh, but very cheap, basically. Can you tell us about the liquid proof of stake? I think I have, broadly. What is the energy intensity of liquid proof of stake compared to proof of stake? Um, I'm not going to go into the kind of the debates of that. I find the energy argument a little bit kind of um, a little bit silly. It's like saying, okay, we have to do things. Everything uses energy. So let's not do things because things use energy. <laughs> it's like some, tech sometimes can be inefficient. I don't think it's that uh, inefficient uh, in the grand scheme of things, but like, it's like inefficient compared to what? Like you're telling me the banking system isn't inefficient, like really inefficient and really energy intensive, those big kind of buildings and like all that kind of tech that runs it, um, all the people needed. Like um, I, I find it very hard to make, to be able to engage with this argument about uh, who, um, what is the most energy intensive thing? What prevents an individual from owning? Nothing. It's just really, really expensive. It would cost you billions. What languages are easy for building smart contracts? So Tezos, um, which we're going to teach you about in the next few weeks. Um, I'm going to show you here because the docs are pretty damn good. So you can go to the Tezos docs and they, you can basically build a LIGO or SmartPy um, in Archetype, in Mickelson. There's many different kind of things you can do. Uh, so we're going to actually go to build and you've got some fantastic tutorials here for you to get started. Uh, and again, it, it depends on your kind of choice of language to begin with. Like if you want to use SmartPy, for instance, like go for SmartPy. Um, and there's the documentation is fantastic. If you're, again, if you're Python, Python based, like go and use SmartPy. If you're like, you want something that gives you maybe a bit more control, like go and use Mickelson. Um, which, uh, but you'll have to learn kind of new syntax um, or go and use LIGO. I mean, it's they 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 build a very good um, a very good kind of uh, suite of things that you can do. Um, again, I think personally, I'm a fairly neutral actor here. Uh, personally, one of the reasons I like Tesla is they are always at the cutting edge of technology. Um, it's it's quite clear at this point. Uh, do you need special computers? No, it's software based. But I would advise uh, something powerful and probably not run it on an actual computer. Uh, it'll slow it down. Uh, good. Well, thank you very much, everyone. That kind of wraps us up, brings us inside the hour. Uh, we're really looking forward to seeing you next week uh, for the Intro to Tesla's event, where we can get starting our hands dirty. Uh, and I'd like, like, love to see all the great feedback as well. Um, so um, see you next week. Um, in the short term, go and tweet about this, about enjoying this event. Uh, sweet uh, in Code Club and Tezos, and we'll give you a little retweet for doing so. Uh, you'll also be for, for participating in this series. You'll be getting... Um, depending on how many events you turn up to over the next eight weeks, this is really important. You'll get an NFT. Uh, this NFT will mean something. Uh, so uh, please do come. You have to come and uh, uh, we need to basically you register through the Eventbrite uh, or and sign and come to the event. We can track your kind of minute by minute attendance. And if you attend broadly, uh, we will give you an NFT uh, for each event you do so. And these will be directly converted to something else fun later. So uh, better than a poke it's actual an actual nft we've designed uh for you guys uh so yeah uh yeah do that's something to note so we'll see you next week bring your friends along if they want nfts as well come and learn about tezos uh and we're delighted to have you so in the meantime everyone have a great uh rest of the uh the day the evening and we'll see you soon bye guys <laughs>